It's time for a new evolution in raising golfers, one that doesn't involve headaches, tears, or heading down the path of unknown. Whether you're trying to introduce children to the game of golf, help them play competitively, or play at a collegiate level, you're in the right place. This show is for any parent, player, or coach who wants to build a better team at home and on the golf course. This is the Raising Golfers Podcast. Hey, what's up, everybody? It is the end of 2020. It's been such a year that being part of a community is what has kept us sane throughout the constant unknowns. Today, Neil and I are going to discuss the importance of the power of an environment and community for junior golf. If in the middle of the environment and the community is our children or the children that we come into contact with, and then also within that community and the environment are the adults, You know, maybe it's important that the adults are critically reflective of what we say, what we do, what we believe. And and, and if we are, then we're able to constantly connect with the people that are in that community. I've been part of a variety of environments and communities from sports teams, personal finance groups, coach groups, parenting, golf groups, the list goes on and on. What I've come to realize is how important they are to us and how doing something together is much more powerful than just trying to do it by ourselves. And today we're going to talk about how important this is for junior golf and how to find the best places for you and your family to find and things to look for beyond and past the quality of the technology, the one-on-one lessons, or the golf course. This is a fantastic conversation between Neil and I and how we break down the importance of the power of an environment and community. Neil, I'm happy to have you back and excited for this conversation. Another discussion topic between yourself and myself, and it's going to be a very unique topic of the power of environment and community. So I think I should talk about where this idea came from first. So I coached golf in America and I coached golf in China, and I didn't really think much about environment. I didn't think much much about community at that time until I went to China and when I first arrived in China at the golf academy I was working for, great academy, great guys that run it. There was one thing I noticed right away that was missing was that the kids would come for a lesson and then they would leave. Another kid would come for a lesson, then he would leave. And it just happened and it we would have multiple kids at one time. So like I would be coaching one kid, the other coach would be coaching another kid, and then they would just both leave. And they never actually knew each other. They would hit balls next to each other for six months to a year at a time but actually never got to know each other. And I was like, something's missing. The environment here isn't right. It needs to improve. And actually it did get better over time. We did change some of the programs uh, to, to help it get better. But over time, I just realized how important I thought the need to have a good positive learning environment and a good culture community around that to help kids thrive. So that's where this idea sparked from. What are your experiences you've had with environments and communities? I think that's a really interesting point you make. And it, it was a, it was a discussion topic that when I read it, I thought, oh, I'm not sure I necessarily know or have a strong opinion on that. But I think, as I said earlier on, we, we, I've dug around and I've sort of thought about it and unpicked it. And it's been a really interesting last week or so trying to look at it and I've sort of, I've sort of, in my mind, I've thought about the environment as being the physical environment of, say, the golf club, the golf course, schools, home, driving range, putting green, and then community being the people and the social side of it. And I think the game of golf is strong or should be strong in both sides of, obviously, the physical environment of the golf course. You know, it's pretty unique in sport that obviously it changes from golf course to golf course. So no golf course is ever going to be the same. And then the community of player, members, staff, all those people at the golf course that probably add to the experience that we have. So it's been a really interesting putting all the notes together and some thoughts. And I'd I'd imagine this is one where, yeah, there's going to be a lot of sort of research that underpins positive environments and positive, positive community. But probably we look to our own experiences and then how we can maybe, like you said, have an influence on the environment and the community. And then I think a word you mentioned, which I wrote down in big scroll the other day, was the culture of that environment and the community. So just over the weekend, it was really interesting, wasn't it? You see the All Blacks played 
I don't know whether you saw that clip of the All Blacks putting down the, the shirt of Maradona against Argentina. I didn't see that clip of them doing that, but yeah. I would say I do know a lot about the All Blacks through books I've read and just obviously their legacy. Yeah, and I think and when I was thinking about positive environments and and and, and more especially positive community, then the All Blacks was maybe one that sprung to mind straight away. And if you look at maybe the sports teams, and, then, and again, that's maybe where golf's quite different, isn't it? That it's an individual sport, but the culture of it is probably more akin to a team environment. What was it about the All Blacks from your perspective that you liked about the environment and community part? Because and, and also, I, sh- I guess we should share, the All Blacks is a rugby team from New Zealand. Some listeners, especially in the States, you know, rugby's not necessarily our number one sport, um, but if you're not familiar with the team, it's something that you should look up because they do have some very interesting things about their culture and their environment and community, but share some of those things just so the listeners have a better picture of, of who they are. I don't think, I don't think by the sound of it was well read on it as you are, but I think it's that link between the, the pointy end of the elite game and the all blacks rugby team who are, you know, the, one of the number one teams within the world, but also it's links with the community, the, the Maori community and the, the heritage and the history um, and how it all sort of fuses together. And that's been the interesting thing, you know, the, the values that they sort of adhere to in their play and the way they behave. And it, when looking at the All Blacks, it also pops up around the Japanese rugby team. And I think I sent you the link and the, the idea that at the end of play, the Japanese rugby team would tidy up their um, changing room and they would leave it as they find it. And that, again, is part of their culture and their community to do such a things. And it just when when reading these things, it just seems powerful. And it's the sort of environment and community that you would want to be involved with because it has those values and beliefs and morals. I totally agree. That again, I suppose when we're when we're as you say for us as coaches or uh, even for us as parents, you know, looking for powerful environments and communities, and maybe just scratching underneath the surface and looking at the morals and the values and the beliefs and the culture of these environments. Um, and I know we're going to talk about it later around our own experiences, but when, I, when I've been looking back and reflecting on my own experiences, my own personal ones, and also maybe the ones of my own children, it's probably the ones we've had the most positive connection with are those ones that have the culture, the, 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 the values, the morals and the beliefs, that maybe beliefs are in line with ours, which again, I suppose is, can be a positive and a negative. So what what are some of your positive experiences you've had with being around a positive learning environment and community? Again, making some notes, I, I left a job um, about, let's say it's 10 years ago, might be short of 10 years ago. So I've been a club pro at a club for nine years, um, established, done well. It was all, all, all very positive and um, the club got sold and, and I moved on and I, and I got a job at a, at a facility, Horsham Golf and Fitness, where, if you like, Jolf was born. So I had the good fortune to meet a colleague, Jonathan Shipstone, and we were charged with um, writing a programme, so to replace what was already there. So we'd been given the opportunity, blank piece of paper, do what you like. The guys who were in charge there, Mike York, very um, positively and, you know, I'll forever be grateful, supported this. Um, so... From Mid Sussex, where I'd always been the club pro, you know, in, in charge to a point, um, working in a team, but people that worked for us, you know, assistants and such, to then work alongside coaches, um, was extremely powerful. You know, we co- we co coached for about a year, so we did pretty much everything together. Weekend coaching, we um, did a lot of group coaching together. We went on the golf course a lot together with our groups. We sat down after sessions, before sessions, during, through, in between sessions. And again, one of the things that's cropped up in my research, the, that, that community of practice we had was so powerful uh, for the common goal to write Jolf. Um, so I look back and it was a fortune that I was able to meet Jonathan and another guy, Dave, and a, and a group of coaches and to be in an environment where we were allowed to trial stuff, mess around, it was it was amazing. It was really was amazing. And we had about a good twelve to eighteen months of doing that, and then we launched Jolf in September of two thousand eleven, and then obviously so on and so forth from there. 
but that's where it was mm-hmm. born. It was born from us literally sitting down with a blank piece of paper and saying, right, if we had the opportunity to write a program of learning, what would we do? Do you think you just, by luck, you were surrounded by guys that were like-minded that helped you kind of culture those thoughts and just create that environment that you were in? I suppose it's luck. I suppose it's luck, luck, good judgment, fortune. And then you, you, you make, you make, you know, we, we had, we had connection, we got on, we had a common goal. We just got on with it. You know, it was all consuming. Yeah. I, you know, for me, you know, when I look back on some of the things as far as that's influenced me and in being in a positive environment and a good community, the first one I would go back to where I originally coached and I look back onto it. And again, at that time, I didn't realize it. I didn't appreciate it, what we actually had, but we had, you know, we, we had in our sessions, we'd have 40 kids with a number of coaches and it wasn't just skills training and hit balls in the range. There was so much more to it that I think the kids got out of because of the environment that they were learning in and just the community that they all knew each other. They saw each other two, three, four times a week. They were friends. They were friends beyond just the practices at the golf course. They knew each other. The families knew each other. The parents knew each other. And then we had a lot of additional things like whether it was tournaments or uh, parent junior events or PGA Junior League is another thing I'd like to touch on that really just created such a positive environment for these de- for these kids to want to come back to every day. And I think beyond what we did as coaches and probably even beyond what parents did as parents raising their kids in golf, that environment helped them grow as people and as golfers, if that's what you want. And so I look back on that and I just think how positive that environment was. However, it's very fragile and something over time or small negatives can actually break that up over time. And I know now that actually where I used to work, they still have junior programs, but it's not like it was six, seven, eight years ago. And it's not because people don't play golf there anymore. It's because something happened to the environment. Something happened to that community. So it's something I think we have to continuously reflect and be aware of and try to continuously grow as a whole group to make it become something and make it stay positive because that's just something I look back on and reflect on, which I think is quite interesting. And I, and I think what's interesting, if you look at the research around communities of practice, so communities of practice will often need linchpins of people. Uh, and I suspect this is the same. I think if you look at... Um, uh, tribes you know there's the, maybe the elder states person in the middle and then the, the people around uh, and and just as I was thinking there you know let's say if there's some coaches listening who want to sort of provide that environment provide the community build the program then you've got to have a linchpin you've got to have people around you but I think also you've got to have one eye on that so the, the ability to sustain it so if mm-hmm. a linchpin moves on or if you know the elder states person moves on how are you going to continue to have that impact? Because because I, I know yeah you, you're right actually I, I, we we worked at a place where we we were busy we had it all going on it was it was, it was superb and then we we moved on and there's not the same offer there on the scale as as, as when 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 we were there working. That said, I think what what they offer is still very positive, but again I, I suppose it's looking at all the parts of the puzzle that make up the quality of the environment and the community. And I'm not sure whether we can necessarily talk about one and the other separately. That's been my thought about it. I think I think my example I used earlier on when we were speaking was that if you so if we we're talking about a positive environment, but if you look at maybe a sort of a less than positive environment that you wouldn't want to be involved with could be prison. Um, so you've got the site, the building the, the, the area, the footprint of the prison, and then you've got the community of the prison that sits within that footprint, which is the people, the the, the guards, the prisoners, the, the, the admin, everything that's involved in it. So that still has that, those linchpins. And it was it was interesting when looking at it, you know, we, we all talk about wanting to create a positive environment, but maybe for us to be able to create a positive and sustainable environment, we may have got to be aware of what a less than positive environment looks like. For us, anyway. I mean, that said, you know, I've quite like I quite like watching some of the prison programs, and there are a lot of people who 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 are in that prison community who want to stay in it because they feel safe there. Yeah, uh, you know, 
if I could bring this back to golf, because I think about this a lot when it comes to the environment. And I think as adults, coaches, definitely parents, for sure. If you look at what it is that your kids are involved in, and then go back to your reason why they're doing what they're doing, I think you do need to reflect and question what actions you are taking and what you're getting your kids involved in. And I'll be specific with this. When kids just go for a one-on-one lesson, there are things that they're going to learn, okay? Kids do en- do enjoy having those classes. But if they're not doing something additional, I do wonder how long that will last, the enjoyment that they're having. How long will the progression of their golf game continue to have if that's all they're doing? And I'm not saying that one-on-one lessons is a bad thing, but I am saying that I personally think that there needs to be more around the environment of the kids learning in the game of golf or exposure or involvement. And I do think that they need to feel a sense of community because they're not going to get so much of that just seeing one adult for one hour, once or twice a week. And so that's my point. And I think that it's overlooked. And I think that sometimes us as adults, when they just see a bunch of kids playing, they just, you know, we think, okay, that's not what we want. We want our kids to be good golfers. They should be hitting balls in the range or they need to be practicing distances with their putting or with their wedges or whatever. But I think that the environment creates so much learning and positivity that a lot of times we can't even physically see that I think it's just something we have to reflect on and understand how important that really is. Okay, so so if what you're saying is, let's say one-to-one coaching is one part of the, the puzzle one part of the development puzzle. And I suppose we we want to maybe put across the fact that there are a lot of other parts of the puzzle. So people might say, well, one-to-one coaching is better than group coaching. So I want my child to have, you know, one-to-one coaching because they get more attention, there'll be more learning done. And when they're they're doing their group coaching, they're just messing around. Whereas in fact, actually, that group coaching might be where they're getting that sense of satisfaction, the enjoyment, the working with others, the the social skills, the making friends. And then they can obviously get, if you like, if you want that technical input or if that's appropriate with the one-to-one session, but it's having that balance, isn't it? Exactly. As well as also maybe saying, you know, we're going to, we're going to golf tournaments to meet new people, to meet new players to play with, to have that experience rather than just, you know, our, our previous talk around going to win. You know, we, we had a chat just before, you know, when people go to a tournament, there's probably more going on than we know about making friends, meeting others, finding that power of community. Again, I think back to probably my time when I played and some of the best days I had was playing for our county, so our regional area, you know, going in the car, going in a minibus, staying over for an evening, making new friends. I mean, some of those people I still meet, I still know today. One guy in particular um, who played for our county and came with us was Rob Rock. So, you know, Rob Rock's done a pretty tidy job of going from Count Staffordshire County player to, you know, winning on a world stage. Yeah, that's very interesting. But but golf's, golf's often obviously an individual sport, isn't it? It's probably thought to be taught individually played individually whereas maybe the power of the game and this is what I believe to be true the power of the game is in its ability for us to all play together enjoy it together learn together we're all going to learn different things at different times and again maybe we need to consider when I say we we as the adults um, in relation to our wants to help children is looking at you know what community can we put around those children for their for their all round well being yeah no i totally agree exactly it's another one of those subjects isn't it that we we you pick it apart and you unpick it and there is so much there so rather than you know the power of the environment play on the golf course make sure it's the right size community have the coach have the team around you oh what about friends i, th- I think Again, just a personal sort of anecdote from me is with my, in particular, my son, as I've said before, my, my children are quite into cricket. My son has probably had exposure to at least a dozen different coaches in his two or three years of both playing and receiving coaching. He's got some that are his favourites and some that he sort of maybe doesn't quite connect with as much as the others. But And, and, and so I've wanted him to have exposure 
to as many different coaches as possible. Different people, different voices, listening to different things, having different experiences, some good, some not so good. And, and, and I wonder in golf whether we, we don't do that. And, I, and I'm not saying it's the right thing because it, it might not be, but in golf, you have your home coach and you might have a county coach or a national coach or so, and no one ever talks. And there, there's then some, some disagreements, there might be some disagreements on views um, when actually it's all good learning for the, for the individual to have exposure to as many different voices as possible. I, I, I think I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's obviously good to, well, l- let me, let me put it in a, a different perspective. I've said this before on the podcast. You don't know what kind of ice cream you like until you try them all. Now I'm not saying you have to like your golf coach, but you also may not know what clicks with you the best, or maybe you don't know which one re- resonates best with the environment you want to be in until you have experience with a lot of different coaches. So that being said, I think that could work for some people. It also might work to stick with the same coach for a long time because that's the environment that you found you're comfortable in, you thrive in, you do well in, and they create the best environment for your liking. So I, w- I would say there's there's two parts to that for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure which one's better, Don't know. but I'm not saying there's wrong in either of them either. No, no, right. no. And I, and I think... And I think having, you know, and if if it was all just about having one-to-one coaching all the while, then very possible you might stay with the same person. But there's there's, there's going to be a limit to what that person can say and do all the while. Whereas again, you know, maybe it's one-to-one, maybe it's group, maybe it's playing alongside, maybe it's just having different experiences with people that adds to a child's or a, an adult's learning journey. Mm. So again, you know, maybe if we're going to put, if we're saying you you want a community, you want your child to sit within a community, that might be a community of more than one coach at more than one facility. Yeah, it's true. It's something to think about for sure. And, and, and the same also with saying, you know, we have we have different people that we play with at different facilities. Now, if, if I remember when I was growing up, I was a member of a golf club and I, by the time I left and move on, I'd probably played with every single member of that golf club in some way, shape or form or knew them. You know, and I go back now, goodness knows how many years later and there's still a lot of them playing golf there that you know do they remember me well they may they may do i mean uh, but 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 i have very very positive experiences of that community that i was involved with i think with all those things said i think would be a good time now to kind of break it all down into different parts because i think there are different parts to think about with environments and community and I guess for those that haven't fully experienced it or even thought about that, the best place to start would be kind of what we, you and I think what it should look like. So maybe you go first. What is it you think a positive learning environment should look like for junior golf? I hadn't written this down and I've only just thought about it before you you said, but I think it needs to be probably caring. I think that needs to be the first thing, you know, from, from all sides, it's got to be a loving caring and we use the word positive but an environment where everybody feels safe now when, when when we use the word safe that's not just physically safe obviously we're playing a sport with metal objects and hard golf balls but also emotionally safe socially safe to to take risks and to be creative and to you know feel as though their voice can be heard and so i wonder if if we were to start with a, a safe environment a caring environment then all everything else would follow because if everybody feels safe and if everybody feels cared for and if everybody everybody feels they they belong, you know, that sense of belonging. And again, I was listening to your podcast with Richard Frank, Frank, Franklin the other day and talked linked into self-determination theory of autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Now I suppose what we're talking about today is the relatedness to the to the community and to the to, to the offer. But also if people feel safe and if people feel cared for then obviously they're going to have autonomy within their, the decisions they make also. So that would probably be my place to start. Now, that's probably also what I would like to be able to do as a, as a parent, as a, as a coach. So if, if I mean, even if, if home had that feeling as well, you know, at home, if everyone feels safe, everyone feels loved. Why would the golf facility or the golf course be any different? So what would be something that you think like just maybe give a couple examples. Kid shows up or a parent shows up. What looks safe? Yeah, I think it's. I think what what's in, what's really interesting. I've had this conversation with a friend of mine. He he's at a facility, and we talked about 
imagining what it would be like as a parent and as a child walking through the door of the facility for the first time. And we, we virtually stepped out that journey, who they would speak to, who they would see, what those people would say, how they would behave, what they would offer them. And, and we looked at it from the parents and the child's perspective and we wanted them to be welcomed. We wanted them to feel as though, again, you know, we knew their name and we remembered their name and we, we, we understood what they wanted. So we were able to then say, OK, well, here are here is the opportunity to go and play. Here is the opportunity to use the driving range. Here is the opportunity to come and have a one to one session. Oh, you might be better off coming to some group sessions first. So it's getting to know the person first um, and then trying to align the offer relative to what you've what you've found out about that person. So, again, I wrote down connections first. So maybe connecting with people on a personal level, building a relationship first. And then, you know, if we're connected with that person, we're then in a much better position to, to be able to help them. For sure. I actually had this idea just as we're talking and I've something I thought about that I want to implement in the future is having like a mentor program within the program. So let's just say a new kid shows up. It might be nice to have either his friend or some other kids come that are familiar with the environment, familiar with the cult, the community and the culture come for the first few days, the first few weeks and just be with that kid to make him feel good. Because that connection, like you just said there, I think would be huge for the kid walking into this scary environment for them where it's like, okay, there's 30 other kids. I see them wearing clothes. that looks like Jordan Spieth and Ricky Fowler. I don't have any of those. I'm just wearing my t-shirt and shorts. And you know, what am I supposed to do? And I think that connection beyond just the adult connecting with the kid, I think that would be quite beneficial. When we have beginners, new, new children come to our sessions. Um, I will always pair them with another child who's probably got some experience and got something about them and has those personal skills to be able to connect with them and I'll give them that role that sort of mentor role as you describe it and often those children do a far better job of selling the the, the sessions and the experience that I could ever do and then you know if, if that parent is with us we will then connect that parent with another parent and again the parents will often do a much better job of selling what we're offering to another parent than, than we could ever do. So we we end up just being the the word we have to use, the, the, the facilitator of connecting these people together. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. Because, you know, people sell what you do better than you could probably yourself, you know, that third person endorsement. For sure. As long as as long as they believe in it as well and they, sure. and, and they appreciate it. And I'm sure you, you, you've got plenty of parents on board with your programs. Yeah, and, and I think maybe if, if coaches are listening in, it's maybe do you as coaches have a relationship with your parents and your children to, to, to trust yourself to do that? And then if parents are listening in, you know, is that something you're experiencing when you go to the golf facility? And I'm not saying if you don't experience it, it's a bad thing, but... You know, is it something that if you, if you want to try and get more connections with other parents and other children, is it something you might have to initiate yourself? You know, we, we don't always have to rely on the coaches to do it. Um, again, one of the things I noted down here is that one of the hugely positive experiences we've had is my, my, my wife is manager of my daughter's and my son's cricket team that she's had massive enjoyment with. So she's volunteered her time and got involved in that way. And the sense of belonging and the connection with the community cricketing community that she's then had has been enormous so you know maybe sometimes if 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 the parent parents listen if you want to do good get involved get involved with that community and it might be a community you know nothing about but if it's a community that wants you or is the right community they'll welcome you with open arms anyway i totally agree i saw that with the pga junior league in the states where we would assign the assistant coach would be a parent and then we'd also have like a team dad or team mom. And basically they would organize the snacks and drinks and food. So each week one parent would bring drinks, one week would parents would bring uh, snacks for the kids. And then it just kind of created this whole culture. And then next thing you know, the parents are getting shirts for the team. So like they're wearing the team color would be, let's just say purple. All of them are wearing purple shirts they had made with the team name that the kids created. So the kids have the autonomy of creating the name. Then you get the parents involved creating this positive environment beyond the golf where they're on the sidelines or after the round they're all wearing their their t-shirts that supports the kids and it's just this awesome environment and community and 
unfortunately it only lasts for two months of the year. Yeah. And, you know, we did run other sessions and throughout the year, but if you could have something like that, just like all year round, I mean, man, I mean, everybody would love it. Kids, parents, coaches. I mean, it's just win, 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 ticking all these boxes. And it sounds exactly like what you just said. But in the States, your your seasons and your sports have tend to be that they're very small windows of opportunity, aren't they? With you know, baseballs, this basketballs, this American football, American football, and then golf has to sit somewhere within that, doesn't it? If you're an athlete, yeah, it's definitely a juggling act, that's for sure. Yeah, right. I mean, you can choose to do obviously what you want. You could choose to do golf all year round if you wanted to, and you know, I'm from California. You can obviously where I'm from in California, you can play golf 365 days of the year, no problem. But if you want to play the sports, yeah, there's a lot of things knocking on the door for you. Soccer, basketball, baseball, everything. But like I was saying, like what you just mentioned there, and uh, that made me think about the PGA Junior League. It's just, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I've seen that. And, 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 I think, and I think it's maybe focusing on all the very positive elements of all those things. You know, we had a conversation before we started around maybe the slightly more negative stuff. But, you know, that, that negative stuff is such a small minority of the time or the efforts that there's so many more positive things. You know, for me, one of the, the power of golf is within the environment and the community involved. So it's a very safe environment to be in. You know, so we look at all the things that are going on in the world, you know, and especially maybe if you've got children that are slightly older, you know, sort of 13, 14, 15, 16, you know, if you're if you're sending them to the golf course, that you know, they're not going to get into a massive amount of trouble going to the golf course and playing golf, you know, as opposed to if they go out the front door or to, to, to wherever, you just don't know where they are. So, again, I, I think golf has that opportunity as a sport to 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 sell or to benefit from the power of the environment and the community i suppose the only thing that we've found over the last few years as coaching children has become more and more that the sense of community around coaching maybe isn't as strong as the sense of community around playing the game and maybe mm-hmm. this is where there's a there's a there's a there's a, a lack of balance sometimes that we we will get a sense of community around some of our coaching sessions and some groups are probably stronger sense of community than others but that doesn't necessarily make it doesn't it doesn't make up for what you've just described of the PGA Junior Golf League so your two examples of the children coming for their individual sessions in China is maybe one end of the spectrum of very little community very little relatedness to the environment and then you go to the other end of the spectrum, which is the PGA Junior League, where, you know, the power of community, the sense of belonging, the the stuff, the swag, which I know when I think in that research that you cited the other week, it wasn't a massive part, but it's still, it's one part of the jigsaw around creating that community and environment. Totally. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree totally. And maybe as, as coaches, sorry, maybe as coaches, we need to think, well, why are we doing it? That's a question. So for me, a question I was asked a little while back was, why do I coach the participants that I do? Which is a tough question to ask sometimes. And then maybe also as a, if looking at it from a parent's perspective, if you're taking your child to that sport or that club or that coach, what, why are we doing that also? So Because I've, I've thought about that with my son is cricket. Why do we take him to these different places where he might have different experiences? Well, to give him lots of different experiences and viewpoints right. and meet new people and put him in unfamiliar surroundings. So going back to the things that you said about how to create this positive environment, things that you do, who needs to adapt more? Do the kids and the parents need to adapt to the coaches or do the coaches or I guess the adults, I guess the the, the parents get kind of thrown on both sides. Uh, you know, they, 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 they're on both sides of this uh, spectrum. Do the coaches and adults have to adapt more to the kids to create this environment? I would probably put it in the hands of the coaches. So I, I would have done a lot of work the last few months, especially through lockdown, reflecting on what we've done. And I've, I've definitely come to the conclusion that, you know, and I've been definitely guilty of this, of imposing the game on the children and the parents. This is golf. This is how it's done. This is what we should do. Rather than maybe presenting them with an environment and an opportunity to join a community that, they will enjoy and want to come back time and time again. And, and also it's, you know, we, we're, we're selling, as coaches, we're selling a, 
an experience, aren't we? We're sort of facilit- setting up and facilitating the experience, and then the co the, the, the customers are the family, aren't they? The customers are the children and the parents that are coming. So it's definitely, mm. it's definitely a tra- there's, there's a transactional affair going on, isn't there? Absolutely. No, I I totally agree. So I suppose as 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 coaches, we've got to be focused on our customers, and if then. You know, as a as a parent, if you're walking into a facility, what sort of connection have you got with the coach? I've been to sessions where the coaches have never looked at us, spoken to us, asked us any questions, never done anything. And then, and this is where, it, well, it's probably for another subject, this isn't it, but this is where said coaches or organisations will then say that it, the parents are the problem or the parents need educating when, you know, maybe we just need speaking to or involving and including. Mm. Again, that's for that's a, that's for a different discussion, but I think it it all comes up in with this the power of environment and community. Absolutely, let's touch on some of that self determination theory stuff because I think that falls into the next category is the feelings that kids have when they're in a positive environment. So, the first one I guess we can talk about maybe is a little bit of, of autonomy. Yeah, uh, for, for me, autonomy. I think offering and allowing children to make choices is an unbelievably strong thing. And I think we we will see children behave and react and act and do things that will completely surprise us if offered choices. And maybe as coaches and also as parents, or you know, if we just use the term adults, as adults, if we're able to offer them safe choices constantly, you know, children know what to do. Children are brilliant. They're, they're born brilliant. Yes. So they'll always know what to do. They'll always make the right decisions for them at that particular time, I believe. I totally agree with you. And I would say even on the next one, like the relatedness or just the feeling of being part of something. Again, just that feeling of just being part of something or a feeling of self-worth for kids when they come and they feel like they did something to, I don't know, create emotions even beyond just themselves, but also those within the, the environment and the community. So an example let's just say they're playing games and they're playing together as a team. And it could be any game related to golf or not golf, but a kid maybe does something and that fires up the entire rest of the team. I I just saw a video actually from Michelle Holmes. She has a junior program in the United States and it was this girl and she was hitting a chip shot. I couldn't even see where the ball went. It didn't even matter. Because no. you see the other two kids, and the kids are probably four or five years old. You see the other two, there's two boys and one girl, the girl's chipping. After she has the chip shot, you can see them kind of anticipating something. And then they all start jumping and they're high-fiving each other and they're giving each other hugs. And you just think like, who knows how good that girl actually is at golf? Maybe that was her best chip of the day. It doesn't actually matter. But the feeling she had, and I can guarantee you how when she went home, how positive she must have felt because she had this feeling of self-worth. She felt like this community, this this importance. And again, it doesn't even matter what she did. Did the ball go in the hole? I have no idea. Did it hit a target? I don't know. Did it go in a circle? It, again, it doesn't matter. But whatever it was, it created this feeling where she has this self-worth and she just felt part of something and, and she felt appreciated by her peers. And I think that's so important for kids. So, so maybe what we're saying is, maybe I'll, again, drawing some, something out of that is saying, well, if we believe that children are brilliant, if we, if we believe that children are able to make their own choices and decisions, and then it's creating those environments and experiences that allow for those moments to happen. And at no mm-hmm. point during that point do we force it. Because mm-hmm. again, as coaches or as adults, sometimes it's like we're in a rush, aren't we? You know, so you look at, I saw that video that you're talk, you're referring to and, you know, there's no rush for them to do anything because <laughs> they've got plenty of time on their hands. You now, if they want to be the under six world champion, then, you know, maybe they need to, to get going. But, you know, maybe also within all this, a question that I think like we said earlier on was the, the, the why, why are we doing it? You now, for them, they're just, there's no why, why they're doing it. They're just doing it because they just love doing it. Mm-hmm. So all of these little things that I think have cropped up during this conversation probably go towards making an environment and a community that's inclusive, allows for choice, allows for a sense of belonging, allows to create those moments. How how do you know? Can it be manufactured? Not sure. I don't know. That'll definitely be one of the 
points that I will reflect on at the end of this conversation that, okay, so what would be the ingredients that goes into an environment in a community that creates these things? That would be definitely a nice piece of homework, wouldn't it? For sure. I mean, I would say at the developmental stage of learning the game of golf, if play is at the forefront and activities that allow kids to do what you just listed off there, then I think that you will see all these positive attributes come out of the environment and the program and the community. And I, and I think along, along with that, I think knowing that there is no rush, which is a hard one as a parent. It's so hard. It's a, it's a really hard one. I, you know, I, I put it in my, my, my little man, you know, he absolutely wants to be a professional cricket player when he grows up. It's what he wants to do. So 10 mm. years old, wants to be a professional cricket player. And there are some times I have to catch myself to think before I say, come on, let's go and let's go and practice. Let's go and do this. You need, you need to. And it's like, oh, no, we don't. We don't need to rush. You know, it's on him. It's on him. It's not on me. I will be there all the way to support him on, on that journey, wherever that journey takes him and us. But it's not our need. For sure. It's not my need. It's, and it's a, it's a really difficult. I know this. I say I know this stuff. I have an awareness of this stuff, and I still have to catch myself. And and again, maybe to the to the parents that are listening, just you know, when we say the words need and must and should, just stop and think: Do we need to? Must we? Is it a should or is it a could? Because there's a big difference between those two things. Absolutely, and I had the same feelings with you, with obviously my younger kids. My, my oldest is the one that's capable of doing activities and sports, right? But it's the exact same feeling. And like, we talk about this, I think about it day in and day out and then it happens and it's like, words are about to come out of my mouth and I catch myself. <laughs> and I'm, I think I, I'm, I talk about these things in the podcast. I talk about these things with other coaches. I, I talk about these things with my wife. Why am I about to say that? But it just our nature as parents, sometimes it's difficult. Like you said, I think it's the best way to say it. But as long as you're consistently reflecting on it, thinking about the why, and again, understanding what you said just the beginning of this part, which is that there's no need for a rush and there's time. And you look at other areas beyond just the immediate results, whether that means hit the ball farther, hit the ball straighter, hit the ball in the air, score on the golf course, whatever. I think you could, again, find so many other things over a period of time where your kid has actually improved, whether it's within the sport or just in life. You know, and like I look at my son's, uh, how he hits golf balls and how he hits him a year ago. He probably hit the ball a little bit better a year ago than he does now. However, what the skills he's learned in the last year if he had just focused on hitting the golf ball and not practice any of those other things like playing soccer, playing baseball, running, doing other types of coordination skills, drawing, writing, building a snowman, whatever, right? Then sure, maybe the immediate result might be a little bit different. But I think for the if you think about the long term, as far as skills go and developmental skills, it's going to show eventually that the kids are going to continue to progress if that's even what you want, right? And it's again, going back to what you said, there is no need for a rush. And I think we all just have to take a deep breath and again, reflect and just think about the original why. If in the middle of the environment and the community is our children or the children that we come into contact with, and then also within that community and the environment are the adults, you know, maybe it's important that the adults are critically reflective of what mm. we say, what we do, what we believe. And, and, and if we are, then we're able to constantly connect with the people that are in that community. Mm -hmm. Cause that was one of the, that was, you know, I'm not drawing this to a close necessarily, but that was one of the things I sort of thought to myself, you know, what would the adults, how would the adults behave? What would they be like within this sort of powerful environmental community? And, you know, I suppose you, you could cite examples. I could cite examples of people that I've met or communities we've been in part with. And I also think, you know, you look at come back to maybe the all blacks rugby. It's just a given. That's what we do because mm -hmm. we are the All Blacks rugby team and the all, mm -hmm. and we have these values and these beliefs and these morals and this is what's underpinned who we are for from the time you're born to the time you play for the All Blacks. That Put that black shirt on at the end of it. Well, I think we can maybe give a few pieces of advice or actionable tips, I think, for parents here as we're starting to close this conversation today. And... I would say the first one that I thought about was 
how can parents search for these types of environments and communities? You know, what should parents be doing beyond just taking their kid to the closest club that has a, a, a coach that teaches juniors? What would you think, like, what should parents or adults be doing to look for these types of environments? I think it's maybe talking to other parents, talking to other adults, you know, word of mouth. I think he's probably still, isn't it still probably one of the strongest forms of advertising? Um, mm. You know, maybe doing your research, you know, if, if say there's a club that is close to you or not so close to you, but maybe looking at, you know, timelines on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and what are they saying? And, and again, just considering what they say and is it consistent and is it what you want to hear? And, um, and then just trying stuff, you know, go along have a go, see what it looks like, make no commitments. You don't have to make a, you know, in golf, we can be quite transient anyway, can't we? You know, we, we don't have to pin our sales to the mass to anywhere, really. You know, you can be a member of somewhere. You can be a member of more than one golf club, play lots of different places. And I suppose, thinking about it from a golf perspective, variety is, variability is quite important. Let's say, Absolutely. let's say, let's digress from our, all of our beliefs and say, right, creating tour players is is the main point of what we do in this. Let's say that's really important. Well, one of the skills of a tour player is that they can fly through time zones, play on different golf courses, <laughs> and, and adapt and be flexible. Mm -hmm. So if that were the goal, and it never is for me, or you know, but if that were the goal, then let's just start off like that. Right. You, you've, so you have a lot more skills you have to learn beyond just playing the game of golf, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Just go and play a new golf course Every single week. Because hmm. because I, I sometimes think about it. If you've got a child, let, let's say five years old even, well, i tell you what we'll do. Each weekend, we'll travel to the nearest crazy golf course and we'll play all the crazy golf courses in the local area. And then we'll travel to all the different driving range. My, again, my son will go to the driving range. He's got one fa he's got a number of different favourite driving ranges that he likes going to. Some of them have got the ball where it pops up. Some of, some of them have got the simulators on it. And so we go, we go to all different ones. Yeah, I was thinking about story with uh, Brooks Kepka because he was on the Challenge Tour and the European Tour for a long time before he made it to the PGA right. Tour. And like most PGA Tour professionals, it wasn't an easy path to get there. But he has some crazy stories where he was like in India and in some parts of the Middle East where he said he was in some very sticky situations where yeah. if he didn't have skills of basically being able to not necessarily physically defend himself, but be prepared to not be taken advantage of, then he could have been taken advantage of and been in really bad situations. But because of his personality, and I think parts of his upbringing, he was able to kind of get through some of those very difficult situations. And then on top of that, imagine you have these things happening outside of golf and then you got to go play in a tournament. You know, you've got to then be able to switch your mind off of what has just happened off the golf course and then be able to take it on the golf course. So like you said, that example, I think is a great example of understanding that there's a heck of a lot more skills that actually you have to learn even to get to that goal, if that is your goal to play on the tour. And, and I think if you're a parent listening in, it's maybe, you know, what sort of environment do you want to take your children into? What sort of community, what do you want them to be involved with? Giving them the choices around that. Um, and, and, and a word I just wrote down is maybe just listening to you know the fabric of the environment and the community you know what it looks like what it feels like what it sounds like what it smells like i was thinking back to examples of learning environments and so maybe you know the classroom at school you know when you look at the differences between you know reception i'm going to use english reception for five-year-olds all the way up to year 11 15 16 year olds the fabric of that classroom changes dramatically but learning is still the heart of it and i'm not saying it always changes for the positive either you know you look at secondary school 11 plus children go into classrooms that aren't maybe the inspiring environments um, and I was also thinking relative to school especially here in England where we've got primary school um, very they're very caring environments and then when children move from primary school at 10 11 years old and they go to secondary school I'm not saying they're not caring but they're very very different environments to to, to walk into and very different communities. So the community of primary school and the community of secondary school, you might need to translate that for anybody else. Maybe the yeah, so that would be business. elementary school and middle school, basically. Okay. Right? So, so but, I mean, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but those, the environments and the community in those places are quite different places. 
For sure. I mean, in the States, when you go to middle school, you then don't stay in the same classroom the whole day with one teacher. You start yes. to going to different subjects, right? So it's like yes. you've got an English teacher, you've got a PE teacher, you've got a Spanish teacher, you've got a science teacher, you've got a math teacher, and it's all different, different classrooms, different parts yeah. of the school. Again, it's just completely changing, right? And you have to adapt. And so if we look at it in respect to the children's all round educational development, that's positive, I would say. But in golf, the tradition and the culture might be just to pin your tails to mass with, say, one coach or one place. Now, again, I'm not saying that's wrong, but I would I would reflect on that also. Probably from my own perspective as a coach and also from my own perspective as a parent and then all the things in the middle. For sure. I mean, I think the things we talked about, it's very clear what you can get out of a positive environment. I mean, you get the teamwork you get learning from making mistakes. You get, you know, you get the accountability of the people that are in your group or in your community. If that's something that's needed, maybe that's beyond some of the developmental stages. And one quote I would like to end with was one that I found from Helen Keller. And she said, alone, we can do so little together. We can do so much. And I think that resonates just with what we talked about today. And I think if you want your kid to thrive in a positive learning environment in the game of golf, I think you've got to think that there has to be some element of environment, community, and culture beyond just having one-on-one lessons. I would totally agree because the, the, the quote I came up with was, it takes a village to raise a child. I love that. Because when I was looking at community and when I was looking at you know the power of the environment, the community, and, and, I, and I thought, yeah, that, that would sum up, if we were to conclude And if I was to think what I would want to be able to set up as a coach or a parent or an an adult or, you know, and then and had children in in our care, it takes a village to raise a child. There's lots of people involved. You know, if you've got a child starting the game of golf at five, if if we want them to love it at 20, regardless of the standard that they play at, there's going to be a lot of people involved in that journey. And I suspect the more people involved and the more environments they see. For sure. And not even just, not all adults either, right? No, no. The more people involved and the more environments they experience, the better they will be for it. I'd not really thought about it like that, but it seems obvious, doesn't it? <laughs> right. No, for sure. All this planning for this discussion. And, 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 I, and I, did want, I did want to mention this. And, 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 and I know this is maybe coming from me, but the, and to, the, to the listeners, you know, Travis and I have spent a lot of time talking off and throwing a subject in like the power of environment and then going away and considering it and unpicking it from our own perspective and then having the opportunity to talk about it with somebody else unbelievably powerful unbelievably powerful so you know maybe my challenge to the listeners is that whether you be coaches or whether you're parents or whoever you are out there um you know if there is a subject that you want to discuss you know find somebody to, to 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 discuss it with i mean we've had Goodness knows how many texts go backwards and forwards, emails go backwards and forwards before we do this. And, and we've spoken about probably a quarter of the things that we had on our list. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's but it's unbelievably powerful for our own learning and our own understanding as well. Well, and just think of the motivation between you and I, right? What are we going to do? We're going to go try to implement more of these things into what we're already doing Touch with our coaching programs, with our parenting, and just to get better, right? And and it's just that power of the community between you and me about these things and these topics. So, and that's just two of us. Imagine if all of a sudden we had a room of 20 of us in a room. I mean, it would just probably amplify it, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, I think, I think in, in, like you said, in drawing to conclusion, if if we as adults can provide our children with the opportunity to play with lots of different people in lots of different places, we wouldn't be going too far wrong. I totally agree. I love that. Let's end it on that. Neil, thank you so much for taking the time to come have this discussion with me. Again, there's a lot we could continue to carry on about this topic. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I know that we had a lot of thoughts to put into this before the conversation, but we will end it there. I think we covered some of the main things that we were, that we want to talk about and share with the listeners. And I think there'll be a lot that they could take away. And if anything, how you concluded it, I think that'll be best. So let's end it on that. Thank you again, Neil. It was awesome. Thanks, Travis. That was awesome. Awesome. That is the power of a positive environment and community right there. 
it's easy to look past how important this really is for the development of your junior golfer. Do yourself a favor and think, how positive is the environment my child is in? What part of this community keeps him wanting to come back to golf class every week? Or what about that environment motivates her to want to play more golf on the golf course? Then ask your child, what does they like about the place that they're having classes or playing golf at to see if that really is the best fit for them? If the environment is positive and the community is working together to make their environment and culture a better place, then everyone will succeed, period. I really enjoyed that conversation with Neil. Let us know what your thoughts are about this episode. Any questions you have about this, we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to help you out and dive even deeper into this topic because we believe this is really important. Hope you enjoyed that episode and look forward to hearing back from you. If you enjoy listening to our podcast and the information you got from this episode, do us a favor and continue to support us by hitting that subscribe button and giving us a five-star review. Your continued support will help us continue to grow and be able to interview some of the most experienced parents, coaches, and players in the golf industry to help you continue to raise your golfer to their full potential.